July of 1969, a courier was dispatched to Hanoi to deliver a secret letter to the ailing Ho Chi Minh, national hero and leader of the North Vietnamese people. The letter was written by U.S. President Richard Nixon and was part peace offering, part ultimatum. Having promised the American people a quick end to the war in Southeast Asia, the newly elected president was now threatening that if peace negotiations between the North Vietnamese and the American delegations in Paris did not produce the desired results, the people of Hanoi would be made to suffer. On August 30th, Nixon received a letter back from Ho Chi Minh stating that while he was deeply touched at the rising toll of death of young Americans, his government would not bend in the face of threats. To Nixon's consternation, the leader of this tiny, underdeveloped country was rebuffing his offer. Considering Ho's history with the United States, it was an ironic twist of fate. After World War I, and again after World War II, Ho Chi Minh had personally lobbied American presidents, hoping to convince the world's greatest democracy to champion Vietnam's struggle for independence from France. But Woodrow Wilson and Harry Truman both ignored Ho's requests. In many ways, you could look back on the whole relationship between the United States and Ho Chi Minh and see a lot of what you might call lost occasions, opportunities when we could have made deals with him. Then on September 2nd, 1969, at the age of 79, Ho Chi Minh died. The singular impression I have with respect to how Ho's passing influenced the conduct of the war is that it was a, almost a blood debt that the men of the Politburo felt they owed to Ho Chi Minh to persevere in that war. As Ho's followers prepared to dig in for the long haul, President Nixon began planning a secret and brutal assault on North Vietnam, codenamed Da Kuk. Like other American presidents before him, Nixon mistakenly believed that American firepower could crush his opponents. And the key to understanding why the Vietnam War was unwinnable from the American point of view is you're up against an enemy that's prepared to take unlimited losses. And Ho Chi Minh, when he said, I will lose 10 men for every one of yours and I'll win in the end, that's something that the United States should have understood. Nor did American policymakers understand that Ho Chi Minh's successors were no less determined than their former leader to use every trick of deception they could muster to outwit and outlast the world's greatest superpower. To counter overwhelming firepower, Ho's forces relied on stealth and secrecy. His agents quietly permeated all levels of society in South Vietnam while preventing any intrusions into the closed culture of the North. In the end, Ho and his followers turned the use of intelligence into the ultimate art of war. Ho Chi Minh, a pseudonym which means the bringer of light, was born Huy Sinh Cun in 1890 in the French colony of Vietnam. One of the boy's earliest memories was of the misery caused by French officials entering his town to conscript villagers to build a road. Many of these laborers never returned to their families. Ho's sensitivity to the plight of his people was sharpened in 1908 at the age of 17, when he noticed a crowd of peasants streaming into the imperial capital of Hue. 
Ho offered his services as interpreter to present the peasants' demands in French to the colonial governor. After the French squelched the rebellion, security agents went to Ho's high school to demand that he be dismissed. The incident put an end to his formal schooling and marked Ho as a troublemaker who needed to be kept under surveillance. It's at that point that he began to live what we might call a clandestine existence and learned the value of operating under a pseudonym. And he was, in fact, uh, under a pseudonym from that point on, almost literally till the end of his life. Two years later in Saigon, Ho signed on as a stoker and galley boy aboard a French freighter. He spent nearly three years at sea and in France before settling in Brooklyn as an itinerant laborer. He was surprised that the immigrants he saw on the streets of New York enjoyed greater dignity and freedom than the Vietnamese in their own homeland. After his return to Europe, Ho began to flirt with revolutionary politics. Near the end of World War I, he moved back to Paris, where 100,000 Vietnamese had arrived to serve as soldiers and laborers for the Allied cause. Writing under the alias Nguyen Ai Wuk, he preached self-determination for Vietnam. In 1919, Ho learned that the American President Woodrow Wilson was coming to Versailles for the conference that would formally end World War I. Wilson had espoused a doctrine of liberation for colonial people around the world, leaving Ho with the hope that the U.S. President would support Vietnam in its struggle to break free from French rule. Full of optimism, Ho went to Versailles' Hall of Mirrors to present Wilson with a petition. When that petition was ignored, as it was, not only by the Allied leaders meeting at Versailles, but also by the French government, he concluded that all of the, the promises of self-determination and human dignity and human rights that emanated from Western civilization, in a sense, was simply hypocrisy. After the rejection of his petition, Ho Chi Minh decided to turn to the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia as a model for obtaining liberation for his people. He became one of the founding members of the French Communist Party and quickly came to the attention of the French secret police. The French have terrific security systems. They have a terrific network of spies everywhere. Not only Frenchmen, they would have Vietnamese spies. There's a word called a dossier, right? Which the French invented that word. The French had these piles of dossiers on everybody. They had information on everybody. They had stuff that went back to when he was a kid. They had kept records of every time he squeaked. In 1923, Ho received an invitation from the Bolsheviks to undergo formal training as an agent so that he could be sent back to his homeland to create an Indo-Chinese Communist Party. By this time, the French police were close on his trail, and as he departed for Russia, he attempted to make a cloak-and-dagger escape. It's one of these James Bond-type stories. He went into a movie theater, changed clothes in the movie theater, came out a side door, got in a taxi cab, uh, fled very quickly to the railroad station, put on another set of clothes, got on the train, and uh, went across Europe and eventually ended up in Moscow. Ho used his time in the Soviet Union to attend an academy for Asian insurgents where he learned Lenin's key dictum. Revolution must be launched under favorable conditions. He would wait another 20 years before staging his revolution, and even then, he may have acted prematurely. In 1940, a tidal wave swept over Southeast Asia as Japanese soldiers poured down from China, easily crushing the French administration in Vietnam. 
Ho Chi Minh, who had been wandering the world ever since he left his homeland in 1911, now sensed that the time was right to return to Vietnam. Encouraged by Roosevelt and Churchill's Atlantic Charter, which pledged to restore self-government to colonial people around the world, Ho started to build his revolutionary movement. From South China, Ho snuck across the border into the jungle of northern Vietnam and began to pull together a ragtag guerrilla band he called the Viet Minh, which stood for the Vietnamese Independence League. Not far away, a group of intelligence agents with the U.S. Office of Strategic Services, or OSS, had established their own beachhead in Southeast Asia. Ho soon realized that the close proximity of the OSS might present him with an opportunity. He became convinced that if he could persuade some of these local OSS detachments, that he could provide them with good, solid intelligence information on Japanese troop movements, that the United States might recognize his movement as the legitimate representative of Vietnamese nationalism when the war was over. When some of Ho's operatives saw the Japanese shoot down an American single-engine reconnaissance plane, Ho sent his men to rescue the pilot. The Viet Minh brought the injured flyer back to headquarters. Lieutenant Rudolf Shaw was surprised by the greeting he got from their leader. And the way he described it was, this uh, older man with a wispy beard came out of a hut and looked at him and said, hello, pilot, where are you from? It did not take Ho long to realize that if he personally delivered Shaw to the American base in Kunming, South China, he might create an obligation on the Americans' part to do something for him in return. But when he reached the Chinese border, the authorities allowed Shaw to proceed and barred Ho from boarding the train. Ho Chi Minh had to go on foot <laughs> and didn't get to Kunming until a week or two later. By the time he got back to Kunming, Shaw was already on his way back into the United States. In recognition of his feat, Ho was granted an audience with Flying Tiger's ace, General Claire Chenault, who asked Ho if there was some way he could repay the favor. And according to the story, Ho Chi Minh says, I really, at this stage, all I want is an autograph photograph of you. Cheneau gives him an autograph photograph, Cheneau being sort of an egotistical guy. When talk of the proficiency of Ho's intelligence network reached an OSS team codenamed Deer, these American secret agents began to think that Ho might be resourceful enough to undertake the dangerous task of sabotaging a Japanese rail line that ran through the jungle. Carlton Swift was one of those assigned to approach Ho while he was still in Kunming. It took us a while to run down Ho, sitting in the Office of War Information, reading Time magazine and uh, Encyclopedia Britannica. And he said, why, yes, we'd be glad to fight the Japanese mounted operation. Members of the Deer team parachuted into a jungle clearing near Ho's camp to begin training the Viet Minh. No sooner had they begun than the operation was cut short by the atomic blast over Hiroshima and the defeat of the Japanese. Ho urged his followers to launch a general uprising to seize political power before the French administration could restore itself. In order to attract a broad base of support, Ho very cleverly disguised his communist ideology, emphasizing instead his patriotism and desire to initiate social reform. It would not be until war's end that the craftiness of Ho's request to have Chenault autograph his photo would become apparent. <laughs> 
Then working to persuade other nationalists to join his movement over rival factions, Ho was able to pretend that he had American support. Out comes the photograph <laughs> of Claire Chenault to my good friend Ho Chi Minh. And that picture, apparently, he took all over this area along the border to prove that he had the recognition of the United States, which, of course, it was nothing of the kind. It was simply a casual gesture by Chadal. Although the Americans who dealt with Ho during the war remembered him fondly, from an official U.S. perspective, he was expendable. The question of who would be in control of Vietnam's future soon took a back seat to the realities of international politics. In 1945, President Roosevelt died, leaving his successor, Harry Truman, to contend with rebuilding the economy of post-war Europe and the containment of global communism. I sent three cables to Truman and Secretary of State from Ho, pleading for assistance in, in dealing with the French. There is no evidence that President Truman ever read the cables sent on Ho's behalf. And while Truman hoped that the French would liberalize their rule over Vietnam, he was not about to jeopardize U.S. relations with an old ally. However, in Vietnam, the movement for self-determination had taken on the proportions of a groundswell. On September 2nd, 1945, Ho addressed a crowd of hundreds of thousands in Hanoi's Ba Din Square. Borrowing phrases from America's Declaration of Independence, he asserted Vietnam's independence from France. After the Viet Minh launched a general strike later that month, General Charles de Gaulle called for French troops to be immediately dispatched to Vietnam. It would not be long before the Vietnamese would prove that a people schooled in the techniques of secrecy could accomplish the seemingly impossible. As recovery in the post-war world continued, the strife only seemed to intensify in Vietnam in the late 1940s. Ho Chi Minh now found himself in violent conflict with rival political parties equally determined to win independence for Vietnam. In establishing the communist-led Viet Minh as the dominant political group, Ho and his followers undertook a campaign of suppression and assassination. The Viet Minh controlled a network of secret police that operated at a village level, ferreting out the opposition and forcing many to lead shadow lives. Bui Ziem, a nationalist who would later become South Vietnam's ambassador to the United States, remembers the period as a reign of terror. It is a kind of uh, hide and seek period for all of us, you see. Sleeping here that one night, sleeping there another night. So it was a very, very difficult life. Tensions also continued to grow between the Vietnamese and the French. When fighting broke out in 1946, Ho put his troops under the command of Ho Win Giap a former history professor fascinated by the study of the French Revolution. The conflict escalated in 1950 when communist China sent advisors and equipment to Vietnam and the United States began to equate the defeat of Ho Chi Minh with the containment of communism. In spite of $3 billion in U.S. aid, the French lost ground until General Henri Navarre came up with a secret plan to regain the initiative. Navarre and his subordinates believed they needed a mooring point in the northwest corner of Vietnam from which they could penetrate the Viet Minh's rear guard. He chose as his base an abandoned French command post called Dien Bien Phu, 
he sent paratroopers into Dien Bien Phu and occupied it and more or less dared Ho Chi Minh to, to try to attack it and put it back in Viet Minh hands because Navarre was convinced that it couldn't be taken. At first, Giap utilized the human wave attacks that had worked well for the Chinese during the Korean War. But the Viet Minh suffered enormous losses and were forced to retreat. Even as Navarre poured more troops into Dien Bien Phu, Giap continued to believe that this was the battleground on which to make a stand. Giap decided to switch to a strategy designed to deceive the French. They had what was called the Long-Haired Army, which was an army composed primarily of Vietnamese women who would carry artillery pieces piece by piece over mountain trails up into the mountains right around the base at Dien Bien Phu. With great stealth, the Long-Haired Army managed to infiltrate the area surrounding Dien Bien Phu. Now what they're going to do is dig. And as one of the veterans of that operation told me, he said, the shovel became more important than the gun at that stage. Navarre's commander was the aristocratic Colonel Christian de Castries, a man so overconfident that he had named his three artillery bases after his current mistresses. De Castries anticipated a headlong Viet Minh charge and foolishly disregarded intelligence reports that indicated the Viet Minh had honeycombed the area around Dien Bien Phu with tunnels. Giop's troops ringed the garrison with artillery pieces so effectively that soon the French were unable to drop in equipment or supplies. On May 7, 1954, the Viet Minh rose up and rushed the garrison. On the eve of an international peace conference to resolve the issue, General G. Ops troops raised the red Viet Minh flag over the command bunker at Dien Bien Phu. But in spite of their victory on the battlefield, Ho soon realized that the Viet Minh's bargaining position had been undercut. His two allies, Russia and China, were pushing hard for him to concede to French demands and end the war. However, Ho's colleagues in the Politburo were opposed to compromise. Le Yuan, Pham Van Dong, and Le Doc To had all suffered for years in French prison cells and refused to budge. China's representative, Chou Enlai, flew back to China and held a secret meeting with Ho Chi Minh. And we don't know exactly what went on in the, in the conversation, but certainly he said, look, if we don't have a, a peace agreement now, the Americans are going to come in. You know it as well as I do. Ho finally accepted a compromise that cut Vietnam into two zones pending nationwide elections scheduled to be held in two years. The partition caused a mass exodus of refugees. While many supporters of the Viet Minh fled north, some, like Le Yuan, one of Ho's closest associates, joined the one million refugees moving south. There he remained to covertly work for the revolution. The Politburo watched as the South was put into the hands of a fiercely ambitious U.S.-backed Catholic politician named Niwo Din Ziem. It was not long before Ziem made it clear that he had no intention of allowing the residents of the South to go to the ballot box. He was also quick to institute a massive program to root out and destroy former members of the Viet Minh and Communist Party members. Le Yuan sent secret reports back to Ho, now president of North Vietnam, informing him that Viet Minh loyalists in the South would be completely wiped out unless they resorted to violence. But Ho did not believe the climate was ripe for insurrection and was only willing to authorize covert operations that would intensify the political struggle. 
Ho Chi Minh's hope was that the non-communist government in South Vietnam could be destabilized and forced into disintegration before the United States could get mobilized to do anything about it. In May of 1959, the communists created a secret military unit, codenamed Group 559, after the date on which it was established, to begin cutting a secret supply line from northern Vietnam along the borders of Laos and Cambodia down to the south. In the years to come, these primitive jungle outposts would become known the world over as the Ho Chi Minh Trail. As the battle for the South continued, both sides would discover that victory depended more on stealth than military might. By the early 1960s, the regime of Prime Minister Niwo Din Ziem had antagonized many prominent residents of South Vietnam. Equally offensive to this generation of Vietnamese yearning to be free of foreign domination was the increased intervention of the United States in the affairs of their country. Among the first of the Southerners to join the revolution was a young man who, as a student in Paris, had been inspired by a chance meeting with Ho Chi Minh. His name was Turong Nutong. There was no such thing as an opposition political party that you could join and express your feelings about the need for change. If you were going to do that kind of thing, it had to be underground. And so he was forced into that kind of covert organization with other people who felt the same as he did, and uh, they began to organize a resistance. Tong became one of a handful of Southerners to found a resistance group called the National Liberation Front, or NLF. While Tong's motivation to start the front stemmed from a desire to overthrow ZM, other members of the organization had secret ties to the Communist political party and were following a very different agenda. Those who were in the leadership positions were carrying out communist policy. And the communist policy was to develop a front. And a front, by its nature, is inclusive. So it does everything it can to attract people of various political philosophies. And so in order to do that, the communist element in it has to be hidden. And so it was. So even within this covert organization, there was a secret group that was in fact controlling it. Involvement in the NLF, which included a military arm called the Viet Cong, was so dangerous that members hid their allegiance even from their own families. When Tong encountered his closest friend from childhood, a wealthy Catholic named Pham Yop Tao, or Albert, to his friends, Tong was careful not to reveal his true political leanings. Although Albert had spent his youth serving as a Viet Minh operative, he returned to Saigon like the prodigal son reformed and ready to conform to the values of the Catholic community that flourished under the ZM regime. And so once back into the fold, he was then in the good graces of the government. And he managed really to insert himself into the new government at an increasingly uh, more important level. Because Albert had once been a guerrilla leader during the French phase of the war, Ziem soon viewed him as an expert on anti-guerrilla warfare. As Tong's involvement with the NLF secretly grew, he watched with alarm as his old friend Albert was made the head of Ziem's brainchild, the Strategic Hamlet program. As the director of this program, Albert attempted to relocate South Vietnamese peasants into protected villages, free from communist interference. 
Albert was so successful that it was not long before he was promoted to be the chief of military security for the repressive ZM government. In his position of power, Albert was perfectly placed to pass useful information along to American journalists stationed in Vietnam. He was someone with inside knowledge. He was high up in the, in the military and uh, understood the political dimension. He was a real player, and he made himself available to American journalists. So, uh, yes, he was a source. What neither Tong nor the American journalists who relied on Albert for their stories realized was that Albert, the chief of military security for the ZM regime, was really a secret communist agent for North Vietnam. Journalist Stanley Carno, working for Time magazine, was one of those who was fooled. I didn't know it at the time, but I found out later. He would sometimes yield up some people just to prove that he wasn't a communist. He'd, he'd have some people tortured. And I saw him do it one time. In 1960, in order to mask his real agenda, Albert actually helped suppress a coup to overthrow Prime Minister Ziem. In recognition of Albert's loyalty, Ziem drew him even closer into his inner circle. So this is a communist agent who had penetrated the South Vietnamese government uh, at really the, the highest levels. And his main job was destabilization. By 1963, the work of destabilization was nearly complete. While Ho Chi Minh and the leadership in Hanoi were anxious to oust Ziem, they also realized that Ziem's unpopularity was driving many residents of the South to join the National Liberation Front. Ziem was inadvertently helping Ho and the communist cause. In the end, however, Ziem's demise was brought on by his own intolerance. In May of 1963, Ziem ordered his soldiers to fire on a group of Buddhist activists and blamed their deaths on the Viet Cong. This action was answered by widespread protests and the shocking spectacle of the self-immolation of a Buddhist monk. Ziem's brutality finally eroded the American support he had relied on for so long. Within months, U.S. officials in the Kennedy administration gave their tacit approval to another coup. With Albert's help, insurgents swept into the presidential palace, killing Ziem. Through one coup after another, he was instrumental and he performed that job beautifully. So he was perhaps the, the, the most successful uh, uh, intelligence agent of, during the entire war on either side. So successful was Albert that there was no one working for the American or South Vietnamese side who could be considered his counterpart. Virtually every agent sent north was either killed or compromised. The murder of Ziem was followed three weeks later by the assassination of U.S. President John F. Kennedy. Events had created a power vacuum in Saigon, and the Politburo in Hanoi was left wondering whether or not to escalate their military incursions into the South. In December of 1963, Ho Chi Minh and the Communist Politburo held a council of war. Unlike some of his more hardline colleagues, Ho weighed in on the side of caution. He was extremely wary of provoking further U.S. intervention. The Politburo finally agreed to escalate the military effort in the South without directly involving North Vietnamese troops. This necessitated expanding their secret project, which would soon become known as the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Renewed hostile actions. By the time that U.S. President Lyndon Johnson escalated the war by sending conventional forces to Vietnam, the North had created not just a network by which they could move troops and supplies to the South, 
but also a rear guard complete with hospitals, command headquarters, and lines of communication. Ho Chi Minh loyalist Bui Tin was one of a dozen military specialists to make an early foray down the trail. Like his compatriots, Tin recognized that the North's success would depend largely on intelligence. Knowing about our enemy, this was essential for us, for the reason that we, a small country with limited resources, were fighting against a superpower with advanced weapons and numerous resources. It was our firm belief that we had to know our enemy in order to defeat him. But by the time that U.S. Marines splashed ashore at Da Nang in 1965, Ho Chi Minh's insistence on pursuing a cautious policy toward the Americans had taken its toll. There was a growing consensus within the uh, leadership of the Communist Party in North Vietnam uh, that Ho Chi Minh was naive about the Americans and that he was naive about what had to be done to win victory. Nevertheless, Ho's doctrine of deception remained the modus operandi of Hanoi's leaders. The Vietnam intelligence agents were successful at penetrating the ranks of the South Vietnamese government and army. This gave them a window into U.S. military planning and operations, and the ability to pick and choose the time and place to engage in battle. The essence of guerrilla war is that the guerrilla does not have to fight. He fights when he wants to fight, and therefore he, can, he the guerrilla, can regulate the casualties he's willing to suffer and fight primarily to inflict casualties on your side. In the South, a succession of violent coups brought instability to Saigon. Then in 1965, under the leadership of General Nguyen Van Tao, government forces cracked down on the NLF, and leader Turong Nutong was imprisoned. During his incarceration, Tong learned of Albert's true political identity and discovered that the Tao government had tortured and killed his old friend. Tong was still in prison in 1968 when the North called for a nationwide uprising known as the Tet Offensive, in which the Viet Cong launched an all-out assault against cities throughout the South. After a prison exchange program secured his release, Tong fled with other Viet Cong members to the Iron Triangle, a jungle hideaway along the border of Cambodia. For the next four years, he was constantly subjected to B-52 attacks. However, thanks to the use of sophisticated radar located on board Soviet trawlers anchored off the coast of Guam, many of these strikes failed to have the desired effect. The North Vietnamese would seem to always know when the aircraft were inbound. They seemed to know the routes of ingress the entry penetration routes, uh, the altitudes, uh, and approximately the expected time of the attack. The U.S. suspected that radio operators on board the trawlers were sending encrypted signals via the Russian embassy in Hanoi to the North Vietnamese. But they did not want to fire on the Soviets and risk direct involvement with the communist superpower. By the late 1960s, Ho Chi Minh was ill and no longer making policy decisions. He had ceded authority to Le Yuan, senior member of the Politburo. Pham Van Dong, who took over as prime minister of North Vietnam, and Le Duc To, Henry Kissinger's formidable adversary at the bargaining table. Ho's death from heart failure in 1969 inspired his successors to redouble their efforts. Nothing could possibly diminish their determination to prevail. In 
By 1970, nearly every hamlet in South Vietnam had been penetrated by one or two communist sympathizers. As a newly arrived intelligence officer, Stuart Harrington soon realized just how far Ho's revolution had spread. It really only takes a few people in a hamlet of 450 to control the hamlet. The South Vietnamese government may feel it controls the hamlet in the sense that it has an outpost at the gates to the hamlet with 30 soldiers in it. But the reality is if those 450 people all know that there are three secret Viet Cong in the hamlet, they don't know who they are, but they know they're there, then all of their behavior is conditioned by that knowledge. As an illegal organization outlawed by the southern government, the Viet Cong were forced to use a clandestine means to communicate the intelligence they were gathering. Often this involved writing extremely detailed reports which would be forwarded by couriers. It was during a walk through a rice paddy that Harrington learned how the mechanics of the Ho Chi Minh Revolution worked at grassroots level. The Vietnamese sergeant who was escorting Harrington spotted a girl carrying a basket of fruit. When the sergeant's initial search did not reveal any incriminating evidence, he reacted in anger. He took his M16 rifle and swatted her real hard across the butt. And her wailing that she was innocent and she didn't do anything. And finally, in frustration, he looked at her and he said, let your hair down, because her hair was pinned up. And she let her hair down, and when she did, a thing the size of a cigarette fell out on the ground, and it was a letter from the Viet Cong village chief of that village to his uh, neighboring Viet Cong village chief. Started in 1968, the CIA's Phoenix program, a four-year effort to root out Viet Cong from southern villages, revealed that the entire South Vietnamese countryside was permeated by the followers of Ho Chi Minh. I would say that the intelligence war for a significant part of the Vietnam War, the intelligence war in the countryside was won by the Viet Cong. Ho Chi Minh tapped into a collective yearning for liberation from foreign influence and was able to channel it into an effective fighting force. He dedicated his life to the revolution, as did untold numbers of other communist and non-communist Vietnamese. In 1973, members of the Politburo signed a ceasefire agreement with the United States that led to the withdrawal of all foreign troops from Vietnamese soil. Two and a half years later, the North Vietnamese marched into Saigon as the last Americans escaped by helicopter from the embassy rooftop. Ho Chi Minh did not live to see his dream realized, but his followers did. Winning the revolution and creating the united and independent Vietnam Ho had envisioned more than 50 years earlier.